Welcome to Call It Like I See It, presented by Disruption Now. I'm James Keyes, and on this episode of Call It Like I See It, we're going to discuss what we saw in the book, Talking to Strangers, by Malcolm Gladwell. This book goes into some interesting concepts on how we interact with people, particularly people we don't know well, and reveals several pitfalls that can lead these interactions astray. Joining me today is a man who is not only adept at talking to strangers, but at convincing them to allow him to manage their money. Tunde Ogunlana. Tunde, I don't want you to run into any problems with FINRA, but where is the safest place for my money? <laughs> I'd say the mattress is pretty good right now. <laughs> you know, the old-fashioned way? Yeah, any other <laughs> advice will be illegal. I'll be in legal jeopardy, so the mattress always, you know, mattress is timeless. <laughs> just don't okay, just okay. make sure your house doesn't burn down. Then there, hey, you go. there you go. Then, yeah, that would be a big problem. <laughs> uh, but of course, you'd have other problems then. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah. Now we're recording this on July 26, 2020, and we continue our culture series today by doing some reading between the lines in the book Talking to Strangers by Malcolm Gladwell. This is actually the second Gladwell book that we've discussed as we dove into Outliers in December of 2019 in one of our more popular episodes. Talking to Strangers was actually published in 2019 and really takes a close look at some of the pitfalls we all have to deal with uh, when we interact with strangers. Gladwell summarizes it well, and he says it, it's our strategies in dealing with strangers are flawed, but socially necessary. As with all Gladwell books, he does a great job of explaining things with fascinating true stories from recent history. So you walk away with not just better understanding of a concept, but a better perspective on historical events. In fact, the book is actually centered on the arrest of Sandra Bland um, from a few years back and how that interaction between her and the arresting officer illustrated some of the concepts, some of these, these pitfalls in interacting with strangers that are raised in the book, which making, making this an especially relevant read in our post-George Floyd world. Big picture wise, the book took a close look at three concepts that play a huge role in how we often go wrong when we interact with strangers. These three concepts were default to truth, transparency, and coupling. Tunde, did any of these resonate more with you than the rest or did, did stood out particularly or did, did stand out particularly to you? Yeah, man, I'd say for me, it was default to truth, even mm-hmm. though I, I say that with not wanting to take away with the, um, you know, kind of the, 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 the the, the enlightenment I got from transparency and coupling as well. They were all, all three were very interesting concepts, um, kind of things that I feel like I knew in my gut somewhere, but he did a great job in the book and in, in articulating them and explaining and, and, uh, it was a great read. Um, but default to truth to me was interesting because, um, it had a lot of, it, it, it had a lot of connotations to just who we are as humans or, and how we operate in, in the large groups that we're in. Um, mm-hmm. so, what I got from that is that we all we all kind of I guess like the title default to truth we 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 tend to see or, or want to see uh, the truth in something um, and, and that's a broad term and I could spend an hour I guess going down different rabbit holes and it could be well if I can sum it up quickly yeah I mean it's it's kind of just the benefit of the doubt like we tend to when people represent something to us, we tend to default to assuming that that is true. And it's actually, we have to override that default um, to, 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 to get into when deception happens. And so, uh, you know, it's like part of our evolutionary wiring that causes us to give, because we just couldn't, we'd be running around like crazy if we just doubted everything. If we, if we couldn't believe anything, uh, we would be running around like crazy. And so yeah. it, it's kind of just, it, we, there's a trade-off that we all give and being able to have meaningful social interactions and that sometimes we're just going to be deceived because we tend to, you know, again, it's not a hundred percent, but we tend to take things at face value. Yeah. And, and it reminded me because the show we just did and the, the last show was on stress and we, we covered certain areas like, you know, this technology that we've been living with as, as a society for the last 15, 20 years where, where you've got these algorithms that, um, that 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 kind of end up manipulating um, our our thoughts and, and and our and our views and 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 kind of changing how we see things if we if we allow it to take a hold of us and that's kind of what I felt with his default to truth a little bit that um, like you said about benefit of the doubt yeah it it 
One of the reasons why we're probably a little bit in flux as a society today is that we all have different um, uh, things that we're kind of looking at and following. Yeah. But then the algorithms kind of continue to give us the benefit of the doubt of that particular direction. So we, uh, we, we tend to kind of, we, we end up defaulting to in, in more. We diverge. Kind of, yeah, yeah like we and diverge. I, and what I'm looking for, I guess, is we, we all are defaulting into a more um, specific and segregated lane, in a sense, of thought. And so then when we look up and we see someone else, uh, you know, and how they view things, it's almost so foreign to us because we, we've spent so much time wanting to give benefit of the doubt of certain ideas. And, um, and well, let, let me let me jump in, because mm-hmm. what I what I hear you saying, I think um, it is it's significant is that if we if there's a, a tendency to default to accepting as true what is put in front of you and algorithms see what you consume and what you tend to like and then put more of that in front of you because they they want to keep your attention and so by showing you more of the type of things that it's it it gets that you like it's it, it diverges you from what if someone else tends to like other things they won't see the stuff you see and yeah. you won't see the stuff they see and so everybody is is seeing all this stuff that they're tending to 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 view without doubt without question and they're accepting it as true and so you end up as the algorithms they they send you in opposite directions and so you may have started relatively close in terms of your understanding of what's going on but as you keep getting shown things that are further and incrementally further and further and further away then you end up in a place where what i've been looking at for the past three years is completely different than what someone else has been looking at for the yeah. past three years. And we both assume that what we've been looking at is true. Yeah, and, you and know, it so creates it's, it's actual um, separate almost realities for us. Yeah. And I think, and that's why this takes a little bit of mental gymnastics to get here, um, which is why sometimes I, I'm very careful how I try and get things out of when, I, when we're on this show, because a lot of things are coming together with these concepts that we're talking about, and they can be conflated. But I think what we're speaking to is is a direct... Uh, thing, you know, like strand that can, that one could put on our society today in the United States as to some of our political unrest and some of the tensions we have, because I've seen it in my own relationships, uh, my friends. And this is really all spectrums of political thought and ideology where just a few years ago, let's say over 10 years ago, maybe, or 15 years ago, a lot of people I know were more moderate in their viewpoints. Um, they would, you know, and I know we talked about uh, the article about when broadband hit a small town, uh, pretty soon after that, there was no more split ticket voting in terms of, yeah. you know, people voting yeah. for both Democrats and Republicans um, as, as the same voter, uh, just choosing people that they thought were right versus going um, directly down party line. And that's what I've noticed. And that's what I mean. It's whether someone's liberal or conservative doesn't matter. It's, it's, I've noticed that those who allow or, or who look to, you know, politics a little bit deeper, I guess, and, uh, and allow themselves to be drawn into it, um, they tend to have hardened their views on either side. And I feel like it's a direct result of what we're talking about is, you know, over a decade, they've been looking at things and without knowing it, being led into more and pulled more and more into a direction, whether right or left, by these algorithms, and they're because they're defaulting to truth, and it's almost like I feel like it's sad because we're fighting a war against these companies that know this stuff. You know, they, they, they've got all these psychiatrists and psychologists, and then their pro, their 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 techies program these algorithms, and so we're sitting here, you know, turning on our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you know, our our emails. And we're being assaulted psychologically. <laughs> we don't even know it. Um, yeah, well, we're and, the and product. We don't pay we're for the product, it. Yeah. We're so, actually the product. But think about it. Here we are 10 years later and our country's in flux and we're all wondering why and we're all pointing fingers. And it's and it's amazing reading a book like this and, and kind of understanding things like this is like, wow, this is happening to us. In, yeah, in, in real we don't time. realize it, you know? And, well, think about it like this. If um, if you tend to, to default to, to believing the default to the truth of what you're consuming default that to believe that that is true. And we all watch the same news program 
then we all would be relatively moderate. We still may interpret things differently, but that would moderate us to some center that we share in terms of information. But if we're all looking at separate information, different information, then it can actually, it literally can radicalize us because we are, what we're starting from is going in a completely divergent place. Um, you know, and then in, in the book, they actually, you know, like they gave examples of like this stuff in the CIA, they have spies, counter, sp- counter agents that are in the CIA that people just can't really even identify because when someone says confidently and assertively like, yeah, you know, this, they have an explanation for everything. You question them on this, question them on that. And you can, if, if you go around and if you're looking for, for, for counter agents, counterintelligence agents, and you assume everybody's a counterintelligence agent, that's just as bad. You, you you're undermining the entire system. So yeah. how you, how can you identify the one that, you know, it, and without destroying the rest of the system, you know, the default to truth allow, allows that one to, to kind of be there and, and allows the rest of the system to continue to function because the, all of these th- systems rely on some level of trust. So yeah, it was, it's fascinating in that way, just that trade-off. I know um, for me, the, the thing that stood out the most actually was, was transparency. And what that is, is the concept that we, you know, a, a, us individually tend to believe that we can read we, we we can read people's thoughts or feelings or, or the way their positions from the, the expressions on their face or their body language is basically we think we can read people's mindset from their body language and like it traces back to darwin at least in terms of from an intellectual standpoint um and, and darwin believed that the face was like kind of a billboard of the heart so to speak and gladwell used the 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 tv show friends to illustrate the concept and in friends you know by design the characters always would um, illustrate their mindset and their emotion on their face. If you go back and watch now uh, with people who study these things, and in fact, the book illustrated this, that the, the facial expressions always mirrored the, the dialogue that that per- person was talking about or their reaction to dialogue. Um, but that's not how real, the real world works. And like, really, apparently the thing is, is like for people you know very well, you may be able to kind of get their their mindset and their their emotion from their face. But for strangers, it doesn't work at all. But we, in our minds, as humans, we don't seem to make that distinction. And so we think we can read st- strangers' minds based on the expressions on their face. And like, this comes into our si- society everywhere. You know, every time we interact with people, but like one of the illustrations in the book was what went into bail decisions. And as far as how like the compared a computer making bail decisions based on the, the, a, a, an offender's criminal record and, and objective information. And then you give all that information to a judge and have them make and, and allow the judge to look at the person and see them interact in a court and then make the decision. And the judge actually, by giving the judge additional information as far as how that individual carried themselves and how they looked, the judge would get it wrong more than the computer because the judge was trying to, was tr- actively trying to read that person's emotion and thought process by it by by their their facial expressions and their body language but that additional information was noise basically it wasn't signal it was noise and so that to me is fascinating because i think we all fall into that also just on a day-to-day basis is that we think we can we know what people are thinking based on their facial expression and it they're like deceivers can hide that, you know, like that's yeah. the whole point is people that are good at deception can hide or can obscure what they're thinking from their facial expressions. And we can't tell it what right away, whether someone is a person who's actually trying to deceive us in that way or if they're being earnest. Well, um, I, got, yeah. I got some for that because yeah, um, go ahead. it's um, it's an interesting point. I used to think about this when I was a kid, that if the world could be run off a computer program, we'd have a lot less issues and wars and all that. My only concern was that, you know, I don't think there's a something that could be invented by humans that's that's not hackable. <laughs> so I was thinking, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe let's not have that idea because if someone hacked it and controlled it, it'd be pretty, pretty bad. Um, that I was a teenager when I thought about that concept. And the reason is that's why this book was interesting to what's your point and why I want to jump in because what it really talks about is human emotion. Yeah. That, and that was such a, I mean, if for the audience, if you can check out this book, it was a very interesting um, whole section of this where they talked about that whole, the court system and the judges, yeah. because it was amazing that judges around, it was like 54% of the time to get it right. Um, uh, that's kind of, 
it's a lot more complex than that, but just to kind of really simplify some of the, get, the outcome. And get um, it right means that they can ident- they, they will not release somebody that will either reoffend or that will skip bail, basically. Yeah, that's like, why yeah. one should read the book. I mean, this is, <laughs> we, we are definitely simplifying this part of it. It's very interesting. Um, but yeah. what, what, that, what that taught me kind of reading it was really the difference between the human brain and the computer are things like emotion and irrationality and bias and mm-hmm. you know it's like the things that actually make us human and that's the that's why the concept of entropy to me is so interesting because humanity you know we're not perfect and it's ugly sometimes and when you're thinking about this stuff it's kind of fair and not fair right like it's not fair that a judge is not that accurate <laughs> I mean, think about if you're if you're wrongly accused of something or or yeah. you know you you were going to do the right thing if you were given bail and then you're not given because of just how you look because the judge decides that you look like a criminal or you look like you're innocent if you are a criminal, you know? So what I'm saying is it's that, it's that inability for all of us as human beings to really separate our emotional state or that we think we're rational, but we're not really rational. And I think he made another illusion because I know, you know, I don't want to sound like we're picking on law enforcement or the justice system. He made an interesting, similar um, um, allusion to, uh, I think it was like an orchestra, one of these famous orchestras when they're selecting, um, musicians. And he was saying how they did it like an experiment. And when they couldn't, when they, when they had the person that was auditioning for, you know, whether a cellist, a violinist, a pianist, whatever the kind of position or role was in the orchestra, um, when the, when the people, um, selecting them could not see the performer, uh, they, they tend to select the per, like the better performer. But when yeah. they can see the performer, they were saying things like, you know, weight, you know, appearance in terms of are they attractive or not. Mannerisms. You know, mannerisms. Yeah, like all, this- all that it started um, leaking into the judges' brains and it started affecting their bias. So if someone, if, if you had a great violinist, but let's say they were overweight and they just didn't look friendly, I don't know. They, <laughs> they, they maybe didn't get selected but if that person was not seen and only their music was heard maybe they were selected by 100 percent of the judges so yeah it was a very that's what i mean by not to pick on one industry or one sector of our society it's just as human beings this is what we do and i think again the law enforcement piece well no go ahead i'm sorry i was just gonna say but i think anyone who wants to have an honest discussion about anything um and and really challenge their own ego i mean this is where books are like this are very important because you know, if, if you want to know what makes yourself tick and what makes humans tick, things like this are great to learn because, I mean, that's what I mean. I, it's like it made me challenge my own self. Like, wow, I wonder when I make judgments about things or look at things, how much is really my own bias coming into play versus what I think I'm making rational decisions about. And Well, yeah, that's the know, thing about it. Yeah. Is that um, this is not like it's it's this is a, a aspect of our humanity. Like there, one of the other things that was cited was a German study where they tested the actual like the people who were were given surprising news or sad news or some type of news that would give them an emotional response, and then they asked them, "Do you think that you showed this on your face?" And people were terrible at judging whether or not their face reflected the emotional state uh, that they had at that moment. Like, so this is not something that we're only judging other people on. Like we think this is uh, implicitly, we think this is how we communicate as well. And it's just not like, and I think the law enforcement piece comes up only because a lot of times their judgments are more consequential in your life because their judgments can influence your freedom, um, you know, and, and other very important things. Um, like the, the, one of the stories he went into was Amanda Knox, um, and how her, like, and basically, and, and as it's presented in the book, you know, I'm not making value judgments here, but just her being weird, doing weird things. She was always considered a weird person, you know, in high yeah. school, everything like that. But her doing weird things after this terrible, you know, mur- or murder in, in Italy, those, the things that she was doing that were just kind of puzzling made the authorities think she was guilty. Like, yeah. they're like, oh, she's behaving weirdly, so she must be guilty. But they didn't know that if you if they would have known her for the past 10 years, they'd be like, yeah, she's always doing that kind of weird stuff. Like, she just, you know, that's just her. But they saw that as like, okay, well, they assume this person must normally act, 
and not like this. And but they're only acting like this because they're trying to hide guilt. And so it that type of judgment then caused her to spend all this time in jail. And you know, ultimately, it, it took years and years and years for the thing to get resolved. And so well, it, it's consequential. That's oh, also an example of projection. Um, I think uh, you know where we assume. Like, and I think this is where a lot of times, you know, the victims get blamed for things because, you know, we we think that we we like we assume that someone should act a certain way, <laughs> you know, yeah, when, yeah, no matter yeah. what. And you're right. And it's usually because, based on how we would act. <laughs> no, yeah, that's what I mean by projection. Right. Because yeah. you sit there and say, well, if I wasn't guilty, I wouldn't act like that. Or if I yeah. was guilty, I would act like this and whatever. And I think that's where probably first of all, you're right. When someone is kind of quirky. Um, you know, they run the risk of obviously getting getting labeled or, or or seen certain ways because we're all projecting how we would behave. And a quirky person who's an outlier in that way in society is not going to behave like most of us. Um, and then the second thing I think, which makes it even maybe a little bit more pronounced, um, I'm not sure of uh, you know 100 percent of the details in this case. And I know that our cultures are somewhat similar in terms of Italian and and kind of American. We're all kind of Westernized. But I would assume that when you're in a different country, there's also it even gets more murkier with projection stuff because you've got different cultures. Oh, it so, does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For so sure. That's what I mean. Like, like, and, that was- and, and that's what I'm saying. Like, I know that um, Italy is, as a culture, a country is, is a lot more open sexually than, let's say, we are in the United States. We're a little bit more conservative when it comes to that stuff. Um, so I found it interesting that that's like what the Italian police like immediately focused on. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, they, yeah, like they, yeah. there's a murder in this apartment. Oh, it had to be like a sex game. And this and that. I started thinking like, where are you getting all this from? <laughs> like, like these guys are just, you know, these cops are over here, like, you know, um, you know, projecting their own fantasies onto some like crime scene. Yeah. Like, you know, it's just, it's just, just interesting hearing it all. And it's, it's interesting too, for me anyway, just cause I remember that being in the news, but I didn't really know much. Of, like, I was one of those stories I didn't pay too much attention to. So when I actually, as a side by like drive by viewer of that kind of story, I thought she was guilty just because of the way the media kept projecting this presenting whole thing it. and making a well, big deal about that, it. But that's but that's default to truth. No, though, I know, because, because it was she's like, present, right. she's accused. Yeah, and it's like, okay, and, yeah. and the way that they displayed her was like she was a weirdo. So of course, yeah. you know, and it's just like, okay, well, yeah, she looks kind of crazy. Yeah, you know, oh, they were doing some <laughs> menage a trois sex thing, you know. <laughs> swinging off well, the no, monkey I, bars in the, in the apartment like okay there's someone wrong somebody choke somebody so well <laughs> well but that um i think that is that's one of gladwell's strengths though is the way he re- weaves these real life stories to illustrate his points and you can learn new things or, or see them presented in a different way once you take a, 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 a slightly deeper look into them um so I mean, were there any stories in there that really stood out to you or, or were particularly notable in terms of either? I mean, like you just said there, where you got more information and actually changed the way you view it or just anything. You know, what, what story was there a story that stood out to you the most? Um, there were several. The, the, the chapter at the end about Sandra Bland, um, it's funny, yes. the second time reading it really stood out a lot to me. For various reasons, but before going down that rabbit hole, I would say I was very fascinated by both uh, the CIA stories, the Anna Montez story about the, um, you know, the the the, the, the lady that agent. was very high up in the Defense Intelligence Agency that turned out to be a double agent and was a spy for the Cubans, and then the story about um, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and yeah. um, the whole thing after nine eleven and the interrogations and the way that. Um, because I think, you know, the sad part to me is that, that, and I'll start on that one, the KSM one, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, you know, especially the fact that we all consumed all that information as, as kind of bystanders, you know, watching the news and, and everything over the last 20 years with the war on terror. And I think, you know, what we, we fall into these lines of argument that either you're for or against something, everything's black and white, but there's no real time to slow down and look at the gray areas. And yeah. this was a great example to me because I remember 15 years ago or so during this time, you know, after 9-11, the years after. And, you know, it was scary times. You know, 9-11 was serious. And, you know, for a couple of years, we weren't sure as a country, was this going to happen again? And I, 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 as much as I didn't agree with, uh, I guess, the lies that got us into the Iraq war, I understood, you know, the severity of, of, of kind of the Islamic terrorism situation of Al-Qaeda and all this stuff that was going on. And obviously it had to be dealt with. So clearly 
you know, I, I, I find myself mixed that I don't like the idea of torturing people, but I, I'm sure that what, you know, our government did after in the years after 9-11 actually worked because we weren't attacked again. And we know that there were people that had serious targets on our backs, you know, in terms of uh, what they wanted to do to the United States. And so what I found interesting about this one was the argument, remember that there were the black sites from the CIA, they would, they would render people and just take them to these sites and you would hear that they were waterboarding people and basically torturing people, right? Yeah. And so there was one side that comes down that's like, well, you got to do this. These are bad people. They're animals. You got to torture them. You got to, you got to, you know, if, if a guy knows where the next dirty bomb is and, you know, he, it's going to, we have intelligence that is going to, you know, something's going to happen in the next two weeks. We need to, we need to get this, extract this information any way we can. And then there was another side of the argument that was, well, anything you really glean through torture after a certain point may not be that that effective or relevant because that reliable. At, yeah, that reliable because at some point a human being is going to tell you anything to end the pain that they're suffering. Yeah, and you know, and then it's like you, you know, we politically the the rhetoric becomes you got to pick a side, right? I'm either soft if I think I don't like terror, you know, I don't like torture. So now I well, want, but Tunde, I, I, uh, but Tunde, the sides are never really presented as that. The sides know, are always. That, do you believe in torture or not believe that, in torture? That's my point, and that's yeah. what I'm getting at, is the book really nuanced that in a good way where you saw not only the argument for both and, and, and a little bit of, you know, you understood why the CIA officers felt compelled to really try and get information immediately. You saw, I mean, you heard the severity of what, what they were dealing with at the time. And, and, and then you see the other side where the actual kind of psychologists and neuroscientists, at, at, there was one where... He, he's, he had a good way of saying it. He was like he's talking about the brain and the sleep deprivation. Yeah. And he was saying, what, what's the point of trying to extract something like almost like it was a computer system, like the brain. Yeah. He said, if, if, if you do too much damage to this, to this, to the hardware in here, you're not going to ex extract the information out of this, out of the hardware and software. And he was talking about the brain. And he was basically saying that if you, if you really sleep deprive someone, I mean, they were talking about sleep deprivation in this particular one, then the actual frontal lobe and certain parts of the brain actually stop working properly. So yeah. he was saying that the interrogator, the information they're trying to get at a certain point, you're going to do damage to the person's brain where you're not going to get this information. It becomes That's, inaccessible. Correct. Like and, even and, if they yeah, wanted like, to tell you, they yeah, can't tell you. Like the person can't actually access that information. So yeah. That's what it got me again, thinking back to just us as humans, right? Like what do we really want? I think that's what we get caught into a lot in our society is do we want results or do we want the emotional satisfaction of knowing we got something, right? So it's like, do I really want to learn what this guy who was an Al-Qaeda operative really knows? And, and am, I, am I willing to believe that maybe this guy doesn't know something? Maybe he wasn't Osama bin Laden's best friend and doesn't know everything. So at some point, we just need to stop this and, and put him in jail. Or do I just want the emotional satisfaction of seeing this guy hurt? Because yeah. that makes me feel good. And that's yeah. where I really, like, when I got, I was like, yeah, that's just, that's humans, man. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. it's that fine that, line, that's, like, that, that boils goes down. back to the arguments we're having today in our culture with, like, law enforcement, right? Do, do we really, or do we really want to solve an issue? Or are we just a, a society where certain people want to see it, other people, like, feel good that other people are being kind of stepped on? And then on the flip side, do the people who feel like they're being stepped on when they start talking now about things like, you know, defund the police and all that, do they really, are they really sitting here rationally thinking about a good solution to the injustices in the justice system? Or do they now have their own emotional reaction and just say, let's throw all the bums out and not think about it. So that's what I mean. Everybody on all sides of every argument that we could think of has that kind of moment where is, do I, am I just being emotional and just want to, get at somebody for my own, own emotional desires or satisfaction, or I'm a, do I really just want a solution that is going to move the ball forward in a rational way? And I think, you know, one area I've found is being a parent. When I discipline my kids, sometimes I got to stop and think like that. Am I just trying to yell and scream because I'm the dad and I got to be heard and all that? Or do I want to be effective and, and, and teach my children something that will be you know, resonate long-term in a positive way. And sometimes it's hard. You know, well, no, we that's all... the weighing. That is the weighing. Do you want to be effective or do you want to extract vengeance or blow off steam? 
And, you know, like that's literally the decisions that we're making. Like you said, in many different scenarios, whether it would be how we handle some of these larger societal issues or how we deal with, you know, raising our children. And the, the problem a lot of times is that the two won't, if the two align, then, you know, like we can just, you know, like it's easy. But if the two aren't aligned, like in these scenarios you're given, um, then which one do we value more? And, you know, it, but the question would be a lot of times is do we even realize we're making that choice or is that choice being made somewhere in, our, in the back of our mind? And by the time we think about it, the choice has already been made in ourselves. Like, so it, it's, it's interesting, man. Like, the, actually, the, the story that stood out most to me dealt with crime as well um, or dealt with crime, I should say, and, and, and the um, criminal justice system. And that was the talking about the, 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 sto- the studies as far as policing. As far as how policing go, there were a couple of studies done. They were Kansas City based, actually. And then they influenced how law enforcement uh, went forward over the past, let's say, 40 years, 30 years uh, across the country. And it deals with like in in our society and most societies, crime is still a needle in a haystack. The vast majority of people aren't committing crimes. And so how do you effectively police in an environment like that where the vast majority of people aren't committing crimes? If you're stopping people, if you're, you know, hassling people, you know, the vast majority of people you are stopping and harassing are not criminals. And so there's an inherent tension there. And again, it goes into are you trying to be effective or are you trying to, to exert you know, or, or have some emotional satisfaction, you know, getting retribution just in general on a block of people. And like one of the things in the studies in, in the later study um, that was done in Kansas City, you know, like the basis was, you know, that crime in cities is concentrated. So if you identify and focus a lot of it on a very small area, then you can make a really big difference um, with a relative with relatively less encroachment on people's freedom. Because one of the, the quotes in the book that everything police do um, and this is from Larry Sherman, the designer of the experiment that, that I'm referencing in, in Kansas City, um, is that everything police do in some ways intrudes on someone's liberty. And so if you start with that um, and what the, the I should I should step back, what the, the experiment actually was and the concept it dealt with was the concept of coupling, which is the third of the three that we hadn't mentioned yet of the concepts in the book. And that is, is that certain behaviors are oftentimes coupled with certain environments or certain scenarios. And it's something that we, even if we're given information, we as humans, even if we're given information that supports that, we just have a hard time accepting it. Um, there's like stories in the book dealt with, um, one of the stories dealt with Sylvia Plath and, you know, dealt with suicides in Great Britain. And, and certain, it, it, when there were certain types of, when there was a certain setup, suicides were, that made suicide convenient, suicides were up greatly. And if you took away that, then suicides dropped. Even though the people were still the same, but you took away this this avenue to do it. And so this coupling aspect, people have tried to apply to crime. And so and that's where you go into people are saying crime is highly correlated with certain areas. But these areas actually are relatively small. So in Kansas City, for example, in this, they they limited. Um, so they, they took some aggressive police tactics, but they limited to a very, very, very small area. And, you know, where crime was rampant. I mean, we're talking a matter of streets, not not neighborhoods, not you know, areas of town, but a few streets. And they focused on that, those areas. And they were highly vigilant in those areas in terms of um, just the police presence was great. And they were, you know, talking to people and everything. And they were limited in time as well, only in in the early evening, nighttime. And they were able to to, to make a lot of, uh, or or do a lot to reduce crime in that area, you know, drugs, guns, they were able to, to, to deal with a lot of that stuff. And so, but what the takeaway from that and the larger from the, across the United States was that hyper vigilant policing works, but they omitted the fact that it has to be in a very, 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 very small area. And so you take this. And so one of the results like we, that I know we talked about offline was in North Carolina, you know, over the course of seven years, they increased traffic, doubled traffic stops from 400,000 to 800,000. And out of that increase, they were able to find 17 guns because they're doing it statewide. And so they're just hassling another half a million people because they're saying, hey, if we just hassle a lot of people, we'll shake out some criminals and some crime. But they didn't focus it. And so in, in, as a result, you end up with this. If everything police do intrudes on people's liberties, then you're just intruding on a lot of people's liberties and not in a targeted and focused way. And so the, the idea that and the reason for this, I should I should say, to wrap this all up, is that when the coupling aspect of this was was 
introduced to uh, police superintendents or anything like that. They just didn't buy it. They were like, no, no, no I don't think it's coupled to certain areas. If, if I just you know, if I focus everything on this one area, the crime will just move. But the, the statistics don't say that. The statistics say that if you focus on this this small area, the, the criminals will just, you know, kind of, or the criminals, I mean, the people who, the, the, the tendency to commit crime will just be gone or it will be reduced greatly because you've taken away the desired location of it. And people just implicitly rejected that. And so they were like, no, I'm just going to do that everywhere and subject all these people to this infringement of liberty. And so it's just, it was fascinating to me how someone could see that information take part of it, the part of it that they wanted to, that they liked and say, yeah, yeah, yeah we're just going to, you know, we're going to start, you know, stopping all these people, stop and frisk and yada, 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 but reject the other piece, which appeared to be the linchpin on what made it work. And yeah, so that just, that did boggled yeah, my that, mind, man. That goes back to, I think there's a lot in there about, you know, again, going back to human irrationality and all that, but I think there's a little bit bigger that I thought of. Remember, there, there's a couple things. One is, um, when I read that part, like you're saying about how many, like the in thing about it in, in the same area in a short period of time, the police went from stopping 400,000 to 800,000 people. Um, that's where, that's where I started thinking, you know, it's kind of sad, right? Like the, the police officer on the beat who's pulling over the, the, the person in the car, let's say they're both at the flashpoint of all this. Yeah. And so it kind of got me realizing, too, that, you know, this could be one of the issues we've had in the last decade, 15 years of maybe why there's such a heightened, um, you know, tension between police and the communities that they serve. It certainly is. is. is yeah. Tunde, what it is, is we're setting ourselves up to fail. Correct. And neither side yeah. really is. Well, not, I shouldn't say neither side. People who want criminal justice reform, uh, not the fringes of that, but the people who are in the mainstream of that are pointing at this, at over-policing is this concept. Yeah. Um, so there are people who are talking about this, but it seems like the police are being set up to fail as well, basically. Yeah, that's what I realized from this book. That's my point. Like, it's not fair to the police to be put in this situation. And that's what I put But it's the leadership too. of the police, though, that are setting the, the officers on the beat up to fail. It's also the pressure from the um, political class, right? We've got mayors, we've got city commissioners, we've got people that are pushing law enforcement to do these things. And I think, again, I've, I've alluded to this on other shows, when the Justice Department did their investigation in Ferguson, Missouri, after the Michael Brown killing, they found that it was pressure from the mayor and kind of the non-police side of the political class because they needed to raise revenue for the city but didn't want to raise taxes. So what they told the police is, you're basically going to go there and raise the money off the back of this community. And so it just it, the police ended up pulling over a lot more people and basically harassing people. And so, again, it's, it's yeah. And so, you know, it, the police are being used as, as, a, as kind of the, the, the tip of the spear for a political idea. And that's not fair. That's not fair to the police. Their job is not to raise revenue for a, for a community, you know, for a municipality. Their jobs to you know protect and serve and look at look at crime that's actual, not trying to harass people for things and, and minor infractions. Because well, but uh, that to your point though, that's your problem. Then is that the that the political class that is directing the police that to act in that way aren't looking at them as a as their job is to protect and serve. Correct. They're looking it's, at them to they're using them in another way. Yeah, and and that, but that's what I mean by it's all of us. That because we all are part of the society and we all vote or have the right to vote. So, you know, it's just, that's what I mean that when you, that's why when going back to just, I guess the book and not getting on a whole tangent, but that's to me what I, what, what I got out of some of this stuff was just a whole new way to see a lot of things that we've, been talking about and we've been feeling in our society. Well, tell me this. Uh, did you find, in, in, big picture wise, did you find any common bias or trend that was present in all three in the default to truth, the transparency and coupling or anything that kind of you could see? The, I, you know, you've mentioned the irrationality and things and the emotion of human beings. Uh, so you can either speak on that more or kind of be more specific in terms of what you mean. <laughs> That's tough because the, all three were in, in, like unique in their own way. I would say the common thread actually, was, and you just touched on it, kind of irrationality. And, and I think the thread that I had was just us as people that we are biased, period. Um, and, and by that, I don't mean a racial bias or, or anything. It's just like we all have biases. Like I could, you know, half glass, what do you call it? The glass half full or half empty, let's say. That's a bias. 
I either see the world that way or I, one way or the other. And maybe just through that initial bias of whether I'm more of an optimist or a pessimist type, there might be other biases that lead from that initial kind of uh, trunk of the tree, so to speak, other branches that, that develop. So that's kind of what I got out of the whole thing at 30,000 feet was more of whether it's coupling, transparency, or default to truth. Within those veins and those slices, we all have our own inherent biases that, that permeate us. And I think the challenge is to recognize and be honest with ourselves that we do have those biases and almost like give ourselves the ability to know it's okay. Like I'm a human, I'm not a computer. Um, yeah. There's some, there's some strength to that actually. And there's some weakness to that. Um, the strength is, you know, the Picassos and the, and the beautiful things that we as humans create. Um, the weakness might be, you know, <laughs> nuclear bombs or something like that. You know, we create and we can behave in ways that are detrimental um, to other people. So um, that's kind of what I got of it overarching well, is that this is who we are. Um, and then how do we look at things like we just spent a lot of time, I know, talking about data and, 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 and how the computers or I guess looking at data helps um, cut through a lot of this emotional clouds and these biases. Maybe just how do we apply those? Because the, the judge one to me was interesting because, yeah, an algorithm can do, you know, a computer could, could, could make a much more accurate you know, forecast, but I thought about it. There's always outliers in human beings. So there is the guy that maybe the computer would have said, this person is a high risk, but maybe the judge given that person a chance, maybe that person actually did the right thing with it. And instead of, instead of having- Well, yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the danger because in, in a sense, it, it, you play the statistics and yeah, the computer may over 100 cases not get it wrong as much as the judge correct. judge, but the judge may pick out one or two that it may, that the judge may see more clearly than the computer. Yeah. And then what do we just throw away that? And that's the human aspect. That's the of human this. aspect. And it happens both ways, right? Because the judge lets people go that, you know, that do crimes again. And that's this. And that's the thing I think we just need to understand that as people that, you know, we all have these, these tendencies and we all, Get it right and get it wrong. And I think, you know, that. Well, let me let me jump back um, uh, as far as the um, as far as common biases and stuff. You, you kind of touched on it. Um, but I thought the general unwillingness to rely on data was interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, like it, it, it kind of permeated through all these. But also it, it's necessary. Like there, there's there's a necessary aspect of this. I, it, it was very poignant to me to see like, yes, it, it, the skepticism is needed in some cases, but a life full of skepticism is miserable. Like the, um, like the guy, the guy who, who recognized Bernie Madoff was a, a fraudster, you know, uh, what was it? Markopoulos. Um, but that's just the way he was wired. You know, what was it? The Holy fool, the guy who sees liars and frauds everywhere they look. And that guy's miserable. That guy is, is, you know, walking around, you know, with guns and stuff. Cause he thinks everybody's coming to get him and things yeah. like that. And so, the the the, uh, the flip side of not being able to trust people and or trust and having just that de a, a default distrust can make you crazy and like a lot of this though seems to really come down to it seems like we want to believe that we implicitly have a handle on the world around us like not based on anything we've read or anything like that but just that as we walk around and navigate in our surroundings we want to feel like we have a handle on it and then when we're shown things that show that we don't have a handle on it or hey actually this thing that doesn't play out exactly the way you think it plays out isn't actually true then we tend to want to reject it initially um and so like that piece you know like with the transparency or with anything like it's like oh no no no, no what do you mean i can't just you know, identify when somebody's lying well, to me. Let me, you know, let me jump that? in there because, you know, it's interesting. My brain just tied into a lot of stuff we've talked about on other shows. So um, plug in for the audience to go look at our library. But I digress. Um, <laughs> no, but like last week we talked about astrology, right? And how yeah. NASA, because of their observation and, you know, technology to look into stars and, you know, obviously look light years away and, and, and all our scientific knowledge and data, what do they do? The data that they have challenged what we what we've known as the astrological kind of makeup of the the situation, right? The the the, the um, constellations and the dates of you know, like I'm a Pisces, and Pisces was always February nineteenth to March twenty second or something. Mm -hmm. And now NASA is saying no because of the rotation of the Earth. Pisces is now March eleventh to like April something. Yeah. And so if you are born on March fifth or March tenth. 
you're no longer a Pisces. And a lot of, we talked about the pushback about that, right? Yeah. And it's the same thing. Like, all right, the, the data is t- t- telling me something. Look how many people will reject that. We tend to reject uh, information that flies in the face of what we've held on to emotionally. And that's why it takes generations and sometimes centuries, maybe even millennia, because it's funny with the um, astrology thing, you know, we were talking about how this was created during the Babylonian times 3,000 years ago. And it's, it's held on that long that we just believe that these constellations in the sky somehow matter to our life on Earth. And, um, and so 3,000 years later, NASA says, hey, data tells us something different. Well, but no, no, don't, don't conflate the two issues of where the, const- where, where the actual constellations are in the sky with the meaning of that. Because the NASA, the, the pushback, there were, two, there were pushback on both fronts. But the, the, the first point you made as far as they're just saying, oh, actually, the, the way that the, the Earth uh, is positioned now, the, these constellations are in different locations slightly. And so the dates of when the sun is there and, and the constell- where the constellation is has changed. Just that. You know, is that's not even saying the meaning needs to change. That's just saying the positioning has changed and that's observational and people rejected that. So but looking at all these um, these topics, as as we've discussed, does this make you more or less confident? Um, You know, because you talk about, you know, this being our humanity. Does this make you more or less confident in our ability to improve things Now, you said? It could be decades. It could be centuries. It could be millennia. But just in terms of making the movement, can can we do it? You know, when you see this stuff and you see how we react to it, you see how we're wired. What what do you think? Are, are we, you know, are we, are we going to be treading water forever or or what? Yes. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm sad to say that no, I don't think we can get over ourselves as human beings. Um, I think you know Stephen Hawking, the famous um, you know astronomer and scientist and physicist. Uh, I, I guess he's a physicist first before astronomer, but. Um, He's, he passed away a few years ago, but one of his comments was he really felt like, you know, human beings better find another planet and figure out how to get there. <laughs> because, no, he was saying, like, we're going to destroy ourselves. That's how we're wired. And I think he, I believe that, and it's sad. I, I don't want to be such a, like, a fatalist and defeatist, but what the book showed me is that we can't divorce ourselves as human beings from these things, uh, these emotional states, these biases and all that. And as much as there's a lot of us that want to do the right thing, and want to believe in a greater society and, 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 and the fellow man and all that, there's always enough people that can be manipulated by someone that wants to manipulate them out of fear. And, and, and again, all these concepts like defaulting to truth, if they're just not with it like the rest of us, they can actually be disruptive enough to keep us in this flux. So... You know, that's well, no, a long, I mean, that, way, that, that that's a long way for me to say no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I understand that. Um, I actually, I, I disagree. Now, you, I've called you before. You're, you, I, I think you're, you're prob- possibly the most optimistic person I know and the most pessimistic person I know. Yeah, um, it's, very, it's, it's very difficult to be me, sir. It's, it's a <laughs> lot going on upstairs. Um, I, no, no, that's so why we got all, all um, just pray for my wife. <laughs> but um, me, this brain is not easy. Trust me. <laughs> but I, I'll tell you this. I think that um, in, in this sense, and you're right, like it only takes it doesn't take that many of a percentage of us to make things go down the toilet. And that is an issue. You know, like that will always have that issue. But I think you know, most animals, you know, in, in, in an environment generally you know, will proliferate and then reach a balance. Uh, human beings don't tend to do that. Human beings, in, in some ways at least certain cultures of human beings tend to a- operate actually more like a virus where they get in and they are potentially destructive to their hosts um, and not like an animal that can go into an environment and then reach a balance with it where it is not going to just destroy it. Now, that's not always the case. That's not 100%. But I do think both of those seem to be in us. And so just in the same way that we can be destructive to our host and, and make, make it so the earth or whatever environment is no longer hospitable to us, we also have the capability of, of actually finding balance within you know, whatever society or environment that we're in. Um, the issue is that, and I think knowledge of a bias actually can help a person who is smart enough, who has enough uh, ca- capability, and that's not just calculating smart, but intellectually intelligent, or excuse me, emotionally intelligent as well. Knowledge of a bias can help you overcome that bias to a reasonable degree, not completely, doesn't get rid of it. And so actually us starting to learn more about these biases that are driving us actually is progress in terms of us 
figuring out ways to design our systems to account for it so that we can still deliver better results. The problem is that these things bend over time. It's not like we have a discovery and then everything changes. Because honestly, like you said, it, certain people will never be able to overcome certain things. They probably just need to die out you know, over time and become less prominent. People who have certain mindsets need to become less prominent over time as our understanding of things uh, improves. And so that takes a while. That takes generations. You know, it takes generations for for meaningful change a lot of times to 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 really take hold. And then because we need to make changes culturally, I think our wiring as human beings will allow us to make changes. But our cultural traditions a lot of times become so strong that it takes time to it takes time to build those and it t- takes time to change those. So I think it can happen. I don't think it happens really in a single person's lifetime. And so because of that, it's easy to feel hopeless. But if we keep trying to do better each day individually, then we can move our species and our whole this whole thing that we're doing. We can move it forward over time. And so that's what we have to do. I mean, we control what we can control. Um, You know, don't don't spend too much worrying about the time worrying about the big picture as much as just trying to trying to learn, trying to be better, you know, like trying to move whatever unit you're a part of trying to move that forward and try to move that to a better place. I think we can get somewhere better uh, over time. We've gotten, you look back, there, there are things that may not be better over the last hundred years, but there are things that are, um, you know, so I think it, it, that progress can happen over, you know, and, and, and can take us to a better place in, in a lot of different ways. So this is what, was where I would come down. On. We'll agree to disagree, sir. <laughs> that's what makes us, that's what makes this show fun. Um, yeah. Well, we no, see but, different uh, things. So it's, it's all interesting. Good, the last thing I'll say is I know where we're, we're going to wrap is, um, you know, you use, uh, you're talking about smart people. And that's one thing I've kind of started realizing reading all these kind of books is I think we need it. This is like a grand, grand uh, scale change. I'm proposing, you know, kind of, change or update, let me say update our education system. Yeah. Because I think, you know, there's so many smart people out there and we sometimes wonder how, the, how's this guy with a PhD or, or, you know, this smart person think this way, or, you know, even you look back at, you know, like the second world war, it, 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 the German people were so smart and educated and how did they fall for, you know, the, the, the people allowing the, the Holocaust and all this is because, being smart scholastically and being able to retain information and regurgitate it on an exam. And I don't mean to sound condescending like that, but just that doesn't make, that doesn't give the ability to navigate what we just talked about an hour talking about. Like, yeah, I'm talking your, emotional, your emotional intelligence. State. Yeah, that's yeah, what I'm I mean. talking but emotional I, intelligence. That's what I said about, I think as a, to get to where you believe we can get to and where I don't, um, I think if, if to prove me wrong, we would, one thing society should really consider is updating our education system so that from a young age, I'm talking about elementary school, we start teaching people, you know, children, how to deal with themselves, like our, our own egos, emotions. If we, if we are trained to look at how we emotionally uh, react to these things, we may have a better time not immediately reacting negatively to some of these these things that could be seen as fearful to us and how we were raised. So that's a long way of, of me maybe coming to the middle with you and seeing there could be a way that I may agree with you one day. <laughs> one <laughs> but day. I, I might not be. I don't think I'll be alive for that day to come. Maybe we can I, help set it off. You know. Well, yeah, we can. We can. It's incremental. Yeah, it's incremental. Exactly. It's incremental. 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 And then you get a big jump, and then incremental. Incremental. And then you yeah. might step back. You know, I mean, it could literally could be, and oftentimes is you know two steps forward, one step back, and so. But you just got to keep pushing. So, you know, like, yeah, we can wrap, you know, from that. But ultimately, um, you know, I thought the book was excellent. Um, now, you had a different experience because you listened to it on Audible, um, which you said was was more like in a podcast format. Just briefly speak yeah, on that. I no, mean, it was great. Briefly. Um, I, um, so I, I've become an audiobook nerd. Um, and James, don't kill me, but I got to say it on air here. What really got me into that was the Star Wars audiobooks, um, <laughs> more so because you can kind of hear the whole thing. So... This was the first regular book that was not some kind of fictional thing, you know, stories and all that, that the author made a point to really bring in, not just talk over the book, you know, narrate the, the words, but really bring in outside stuff. So he had interviews uh, from, the, from the various stories, like we talk about the CIA story. So he interviewed the actual CIA um, folks that, that um, for example, um, did the waterboarding and did the, um, the interrogations on Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Um, he had the audio of Sandra Bland and the police officer who pulled. And just her let over. me jump in real yeah. quick because, um, like, and basically, 
where the book would transcribe it, because I read it, where the book would transcribe it, he would actually have the audio as he either took it himself and recorded it or that it was public record or things like that. So it, you got a different experience yeah, in was, terms of hearing it from people's actual, you know, hearing th- from their mouth, basically. Yeah. As far so as I recommend up. people, if they want, if, if you're interested, listen to this whole thing and interested in this book, I definitely would recommend the audio book. And I would recommend to authors or whoever's out there that does audio books, um, I, more books, audio books should be done this way. It was a very, very... Um, um, engaging, uh, engaging, yeah. Like yeah, it, yeah, it brought yeah. me in a little more so than I've experienced in other um, nonfiction audio books. I mean, the fiction ones do have their sound effects yeah. and all that. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mentioned this to you off air, and we, like I said, we're going to wrap. But I wanted to, it, like, I wonder if your impression of people because you got to hear them talk and hear, you know, just the way they said things and things like that. If your impression of people would be different than mine, because I just read the actual text. So you yeah. had more information in terms of whether it, this guy sounded pretty smug or this guy like it. So I wonder. Yeah, no, you know, that's like, all true. Remember, yeah. that's what I'm saying. In, in understanding what we just talked about, I can't deny that you might be right. I got to be humble enough and say, yeah, maybe hearing someone's voice did sway me and, and, and hit one of my subconscious biases that I think yeah. a certain way that I may not have thought of had I just read it. So, so it's interesting. I mean, yeah. but that's, again, this is looking at, this is looking at us, at, at, you know, us as yeah, humans. That's so part of the challenge. So, yeah, uh, well, we appreciate everyone for joining us uh, and joining us, you know, as always, you know, we, we definitely always appreciate uh, spending some time with us, letting us, you know, we go through some of these topics that we find to be interesting and hopefully can add some value uh, to, to your life. You know, so we appreciate it. Subscribe, you know, to the podcast, rate us, review us, tell us what you think. We like five stars. If, if, you, if you think we warrant that, definitely throw that in there. Um, so until next time, uh, I'm James Keys. I'm Tunde Lamana. All right. Talk to you guys soon.